The message today, I admit, is, is uh, again a little bit provocative. And the question is asked, can you or should you break a promise to the devil? And I'll tell you where this comes from. Uh, I was doing some evangelistic meetings in another town years ago. And a, uh, a young adult came to me, a bright, a handsome young man. And he said, uh, Pastor Dick, can I talk to you for a moment? Uh, and he said, uh, you know, I, I, I'm feeling the Lord call me and I'm wanting to give my heart to Jesus. He said, but I've got, I've got a conundrum. He said, uh, years ago when I was a teenager and I was listening to all the music of the world and I got into some of those diabolical bands and started to explore devil worship. And he said, I, I made a vow to the devil. He said, I promised the devil that I would serve him and worship him if he would give me success and power. And uh, he said, I, I became very successful. I've got a great job, powerful position, making a lot of money. And he said, it's kind of left, my life feels hollow. And I've been thinking about my religious upbringing. I came to the meetings. I said, so what do I do? He says, the Bible tells me I'm supposed to keep the Ten Commandments and not lie but I've made a promise to the devil, can you be forgiven? Now before I answer that, I'm not going to answer the question right away, but that's the reason. You tell Christians, you tell people, keep your promises. But what if you made a promise to the devil? Do you keep that one? What is a promise? A promise is a solemn declaration assuring that one will or will not do something, a vow, a covenant, a pledge, to swear or to commit oneself by a promise to do or to give. It's an indication of something favorable to come, an expectation. It comes from the Latin word promateer or pro, forth, and uh, that means to send forth. You're giving your word in advance. And I want to establish at the beginning that especially among Christians, your word ought to mean something promises should be kept. And from time to time we'll have members that get into great financial straits and they say, well pastor, I, I bought a lot of stuff and then I realize I don't have quite enough to pay for all the stuff I bought with my credit cards and so I'm just going to file bankruptcy and uh, tell the people I owe money to, sorry, I've filed chapter 7, 11, 13, 12, whatever you file and I'm just not going to pay you. Now I realize that if you're in a business, there are sometimes unforeseen circumstances and I'm going to let you and the Lord work that out. But Christians ought to be very slow to say we're not going to meet our obligations. Christians should be among the foremost. The Bible says uh, to keep our vows. We're to keep our promises. Exodus 20 verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You're to keep your word. You're not to lie. One of the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy 23, verse 21. When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it will be sin to you. But if you abstain from vowing, it will not be sin. That which is gone from your lips you shall keep and perform. For you voluntarily vowed it to the Lord. And Jesus said, Matthew 5, 33, again you've heard it said, by them of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you will perform your oaths to the Lord. But what if you, what if you make a reckless or a difficult promise? I mean, sometimes when we're young, we promise things. And um, some people have made vows and they realize it was the biggest mistake of their life. I mean, how important is it to keep every promise? And there was a uh, passage, and you ought to read Psalm 15. It's not very long. It's one of the great psalms in the Bible. Psalm 15 begins by asking the question, who will abide in your tabernacle? Who will dwell in your holy hill? And it lists some of the characteristics of the redeemed. And there in verse 4 it says, he who swears to his own hurt and does not change. That means you make a promise. It's going to be very difficult to keep. It'll hurt you to keep it, but you keep it because you made it. 
Have you ever made a promise and you knew it was going to be very hard to keep it, but you said, I gave my word. And uh, that great generation used to say a man's word was his bond. My dad used to make deals, multi-million dollar deals with a shake of a hand. And they do, if he, it was someone he trusted or a friend, he said, well, we'll do the paperwork later, we've got a deal. Because the word meant something. Amen? You know the story in the Bible of Jephthah? One of the famous judges, he was going to lead the children of Israel in battle with an enemy, the people of Ammon. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. And he said, Lord, if you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then it will be whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the people of Ammon, surely it shall be the Lord's and I'll offer it up as a burnt offering. You might wonder, why did he say that? Well, they, you know, made a lot of sacrificial offerings. They would offer goats and sheep and cows and the clean animals to the Lord. And uh, when he said he came to his house, that meant to his property. And they probably had a home with, you know, the barn and an area fenced in and cattle. And I used to have goats. I'd come home. They'd come out and meet me. And whenever your cow sees you coming, they think you got food. They come. Pastor Ross and I were visiting some people in Texas. He got a little nervous while the ch cows started chasing us. It's like a stampede. They just thought we had hay in the back. <laughs> so they come out to meet you. But never did he dream. When he came home victorious from the battle with the Ammonites, the first ones out of the gate was his daughter with the tambourine. Now I think that most of us here would say, oh Lord, you know I didn't mean that. Or that doesn't count. But when he saw his daughter come out, he was coming home saying, Lord, you gave me victory. I've made a promise. I'm going to keep my promise. I'm going to look very carefully for whatever comes out of my gates first. And when he got near home, the family saw him. His daughter ran out. He expected it to be one of the barnyard animals. And he said, I'll ask my daughter, you brought me very low, for I've opened my mouth to the Lord, and I must perform it. She said, Father, let me just go say farewell to my girlfriends and uh, bewail my virginity and then keep your vow. Now a lot of people think, does that mean he offered his daughter as a burnt offering? No, that's against one of the other commandments. But they had a rule that, you know, every, by the way, every male that was born was to be offered to the Lord. But you, you offered a sacrifice in the place of human. God did not believe in human sacrifice. What he did is he then brought his daughter like Hannah brought Samuel. He brought his daughter to the sanctuary to serve before the Lord. You read in the New Testament about Anna in the temple with Simon. It says she served the Lord 80 years from her virginity. And she would never be able to marry. She said, give me 30 days to bewail my virginity, not her death. She was his only daughter. He would have no offspring. And so just in case those of you thought that he was like burning his daughter, that didn't happen. But he kept his promise. That was tough. Now I'll let you talk to the Lord about whether that was right or wrong. I'm just telling you that they took their promises seriously. So should we? A man who swears to his own hurt and change is not. I want to hear an amazing fact. The oldest human in modern times that we know of was a lady in France, Jeanne Calmette. She died at 121 and 160 days. Now there's an interesting backstory. I got her picture somewhere that we're going to put up on the screen. You'll see her and she looks like she's 121. <laughs> and uh, she's holding her Guinness World Record. They researched, a lot of people said, oh yeah, I'm 200 years old. And they do a little research and they're just 90. So, you know, they really researched and found out that she indeed was. And at the time of this, she was, I think... Uh, when she got her certificate, she was the oldest person in the world. She hadn't yet reached 121. She went way beyond the average. And uh, when she was 90 years old, one of her neighbors who was a lawyer, she had a nice apartment she had been in for years. She grew up in a wealthy family. They owned a drapery country, uh, company. And, and uh, he said, look, Jan, if you will, uh, if you will let me take over payments for your apartment, I will give you um, money, I forget what the exact amount was, for the rest of your life, every month, if you'll sign it over to me. And she thought, well, that's a pretty good deal. 
And so she signed over the apartment to this attorney. And then she went on to live another 32 years. <laughs> and they were having to pay her. And then he died. She outlived him. <laughs> but the family said, you know, we made a promise. We had no idea. <laughs> and uh, Jeanne commenting on it, she says, you know, sometimes in life you make bad deals. <laughs> they had to pay her. She lived 121. God has a sense of humor, right? But they kept their promise. Ecclesiastes 5, 5. Better it is that you should not vow than that you vow and not pay. Oswald Chambers said, it's better to run the risk of being considered indecisive than promising too quickly and not fulfilling. Take your time. Think before you make uh, important decisions like that. So can you break a promise to the devil if a person had sold their soul? Before I answer, I want to read to you something. Go in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles 33. This is someone who for outward purposes, is that it appears they sold their soul. His name was Manasseh. Not going to read the whole story, but start with verse 1. Manasseh, this is 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. Now his father was Hezekiah, a good king. Father probably had stored a lot of prayers in heaven for his son. See, Hezekiah knew he wasn't going to live long. Um, two years before Manasseh was born, God had told Hezekiah, you're going to die. And he prayed and he wept and God performed a miracle, made the sun go backwards. He told Hezekiah, I'm giving you 15 years. So he was told he's terminal. But he said, I'm giving you 15 more years. So that's not too bad. So he knew he had a limited time and he prayed for his son. He did all he could, tried to be a good example, but everyone's got a mind of their own. And Hezekiah, boy, he went, you know, some people leave the church and some do it with gusto. Manasseh, sorry. He left the church with great enthusiasm. When he was 12 years old, he became king and he reigned 55 years, longest reigning king of either Israel or Judah. How'd you like to have the same president 55 years? That wasn't meant to be a political comment. In Jerusalem, but he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places where the pagans used to worship their gods, which Hezekiah his father had broken down. And he raised up the altars of the Baals, and he made wooden images, and he worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and he served them. He built altars in the house of the Lord, in which the Lord had said in Jerusalem will be my name forever. And he built altars to all the hosts of heaven, all these pagan gods of the zodiac. And in the courts of the house of the Lord, he also caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom offered his children as sacrifice to devils. He practiced soothsaying and witchcraft and sorcery. And he consulted mediums and spiritists. He was totally into the diabolical arts. I mean, what did he leave out? That was everything. It looks like he made a deal with the devil. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger he even set a carved image, an idol, which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and Solomon, in this house and in Jerusalem, I've chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I'll put my name. So, verse 9, Manasseh seduced Jerus Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. Remember, they were cast out for their wickedness, these pagan nations. He did worse. And you know, as goes the leader, often so goes the people. And the Lord spoke to Manasseh, God so patient, and his people, but they would not listen. He spoke through Isaiah. You know what he did? He put Isaiah in a hollow log and he sawed it in two. He's the one that killed Isaiah the prophet. So when you read in Hebrews that God's faithful went through the fire like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they endured the lions like Daniel, he says, and they were sawn asunder. He's talking about Isaiah, what Manasseh did. Therefore the Lord brought against him because of his sin the captains of the army of Assyria. They conquered Judah and Jerusalem. They went to the palace. They arrested Manasseh. They took him with hooks and they bound him 
with bronze fetters. Sometimes when they conquered a king, they'd actually put a ring in his nose like you do a bull and lead him as a conquered king into the city. And they carried him off to Babylon. Now when, and you're probably thinking, well, you got what was coming to him. Good riddance. Uh, if you and I were in charge, a lot of people wouldn't make it because we wouldn't give them a second chance. We'd think they'd gone too far and committed the unpardonable sin. Now when he was in affliction, they evidently in Babylon, they put him in the dungeon and he was maybe tormented in some way. He implored the Lord, his God. He humbled himself. He didn't just humble himself. He humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, namely Hezekiah, David. And he prayed to him. And he, capital H, that's God, he received his entreaty. He heard his supplication. Evidently forgave his sin. Brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew the Lord was God. And if you read on it says in verse 16, he repaired the altar of the Lord. He sacrificed peace offerings and thank offerings. This is one of the most radical conversions in the Bible. He went from totally sold out for the devil to rebuilding the altar of the Lord and tearing down the high places or the uh, altars and things that he put in the temple. I mean, but he was a witchcraft, soothsaying, spiritist, mediums, talking to the dead, worshiping the zodiac. I mean, he did everything diabolical you can think of and the Lord still saved him. He teaches you and I a lesson. You got to be very careful about giving up on somebody. Uh, God is long suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish. He, pa he is so patient with us. So, can you break a promise to the devil? Well, really what you're asking is, is that the unpardonable sin? If you vow to give your life to the devil, it doesn't say that it is. Is it a sin to make a promise you don't keep? Yes. Does God forgive sin? Yes. Uh, you know, they, they had um, a law in ancient times that when one master bought a slave from someone else, they then assumed responsibility for all the obligations of that purchased slave. So if you come to the Lord and you've been living for the devil and you may have even made some idiotic promises to the devil and you come just like you are, Jesus said, I will pay for your promise. I will pay for your sin. I mean, obviously, if you say, well, no, once you make a promise to the devil, you can't be forgiven. Well, you have no other options. You're lost. But that's not what I'm reading in the Bible. The Bible says that whosoever believes in him, whatever your sins might be, if you are sorry and you repent like Manasseh, God can forgive. That's not, it's not to justify how wrong and dangerous it is to make a reckless vow especially to the devil. Why would anyone promise anything to the devil? You got to know he's up to no good. He doesn't have your best interest in mind. And um, what profit is it if he were to give you the whole world if you lose your soul? But uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, which you have from God, that you are not your own? You know, when uh, some of the immigrants used to get off the boat in New York City, there were always uh, enough con artists to say, you know, I'm so glad today is your lucky day. Uh, it just so happens that uh, I own the Brooklyn Bridge and I've made all the money off the toll that I think I'm ever going to need and I'm going to sell you the bridge. And you'd be surprised how many times the Brooklyn Bridge was sold to gullible immigrants. They thought, what a deal. You never believe. Look, I've got a deed right here. I own the Brooklyn Bridge. They later found out the guy didn't own the Brooklyn Bridge. He couldn't sell it. The devil does not own you. You do not own you. You've been bought with a price. You are the property of Jesus. That sale you made to the devil is null and void because he, you don't even own yourself. You have no right. The only one who owns you is the Lord. He would have to approve the sale. You know, there's a law in the Bible, in the Bible that a child, son or daughter in a family while they're in their father's house, even the wife could not make a vow without the approval of the father. 
Did you know that? Numbers 30 verse 5, but if the father opposes her on the day he hears it, no vow of hers or pledge which she has bound herself shall stand. And the Lord will forgive her because her father opposed her. So in the family, the father had to approve the vow because they were subject to his authority. You didn't even have the right to give yourself to the devil. So do you have to keep a promise to the devil? It's null and void. It doesn't matter. You had no right. See what I'm saying? They say there's a lot of con artists out there today that are looking up people's uh, titles for their homes and they're actually taking out loans in other people's homes and people who thought their house was paid off, they're finding out there's a loan against it because some crook out there was able to finagle the paperwork. Yeah. You're not your own. So can God forgive promise breakers? Well, let's hope so. Did the children of Israel break a promise? God speaks to them from the mountain, gives them the Ten Commandments. They listen. They say, all that the Lord has said we will do. They made a covenant. They made a vow. They made a promise to God. But what happened? Moses went up to get the written transcript, and before he even came back, they were breaking virtually every commandment. So does that mean that he cast them off from being his people? Now God is extremely patient. Matthew 26, Peter answered and said to Jesus, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. He kind of made a public declaration. He's vowing to the other apostles, I will never break my vow. Uh, how did they go for Peter in 24 hours? Uh, the devil showed him how weak he was. And uh, not only did he deny the Lord in a cowardly way, he did it with swearing and cursing. Did Jesus forgive Peter? Were there consequences? You know, Peter had made a vow. You read the different Gospels, the vow of Peter. I did it last night, went through all four cases where he made this promise. And in one place, he said, I will go to death with you. Did Peter ultimately die for Christ? He did. And even after the resurrection, Jesus asked him three times, Peter, do you love me more than these? Because what Peter had said is, Lord, even if all these guys give up on you, uh -huh, not me, I'm not going to give up on you. And Jesus said, well, do you love me more than these? Peter wouldn't even compare anymore. He said, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. If you love me, feed my lambs. And so he was... He had to thoroughly confess and repent of his sin. So I don't, want to under, I don't want to say, yes, God forgives promise breakers. So you guys just go ahead and break all your promises. It is a sin. It is a serious thing. And so don't, get, don't take the wrong thing away from this. God expects us to be the best promise. Christians should be the best promise keepers in the world. Keeping our covenants and keeping our vows. And if any of you are married... That's one of the most important kinds of covenant or vow. And you know what the Bible says about marriage? Jesus said, uh, when God is joined together, let not man put asunder. There is no grounds for divorce saving the cause of fornication. And even that doesn't have to be grounds. There can be forgiveness and reconciliation. And if you're a Christian, you've taken baptismal vows. Those are promises to God. We see some people don't take them very seriously. We think that means we don't have to take them very seriously. God records them in heaven as being important. And we should take those vows seriously. But I'm glad that God forgives vows. You know, there's one interesting story in the Bible. In Acts chapter 23, when uh, they arrested Paul and he was in a Roman jail, the Romans were sort of protecting him. The Jews wanted to all kill him. And Paul's nephew brought him word. He said, there are 40 men that have taken an oath that they will never eat or drink again until they have killed Paul. Remember reading that? And you always wonder what happened to those guys because Paul escaped Jerusalem. Years went by. Did they all die of starvation and thirst? Got to be careful about making a vow like that. Now I'll admit, I remember making a really dumb promise. Uh, I was standing on the road. Yes, I made a, a vow that I broke many times. 
I was standing on the road hitchhiking cross country. I don't even remember where it was, but I remember it was a very forlorn lorn place. And, and everybody was driving by. And I thought, I'm going to die here. No one's ever going to give me a ride. It's out in the middle of nowhere. And I had nowhere to talk to but yourself. And I was a baby Christian. And so I, I was praying. Every car would pick me up. Hours went by. I'm standing there. You're going like this, just trying to get a ride. You're so tired. You're hungry. You want to get out of this place. I said, oh, Lord, I don't know. How can these people not care? I'm out here begging for a ride. I see them in their cars, their trucks. They've got plenty of room. There's no one else in there. They're going my direction. It's not going to cost them anything. How come they don't stop and give me a ride? Never occurred to me. I looked pretty scruffy back then. But, and, and I said, Lord, if I ever get a car, I promise I will pick up every hitchhiker I see. <laughs> now, when I said it, I meant it. And I thought that if I made that's all God was waiting for. He was waiting for me to promise. All right, Lord, I won't do what they're doing. If you give me a car, I promise I'll pick up every hitchhiker. Of course, eventually I got a ride. And I remembered that vow. And when I got my first car, Volkswagen Bug, I tried to pick up every hitchhiker I saw if I was heading the same direction. And sometimes it would be like three guys, a lady, and a dog. <laughs> and uh, I tried to give them all right. And you know that as time went by and my cars got better, I started missing a couple of people here and there. And I'd look at the clock or I'd start to rationalize and say, you know, I, I'm only, I'm turning off next exit. That's a bad place to leave them. They're better off where they're at right now. And I started rationalizing. I thought, oh, you know, this new car, fairly new upholstery. That guy looks a little scruffy. And their dog, I'm not doing that with the dog. No more. And yeah, I still pick up hitchhikers. But I, I said, Lord, you're going to have to forgive me. Because that was a reckless vow. Any of you ever make a reckless promise like that? And now you're all looking at me with narrow eyes like, Doug, how come you're not keeping that promise? Let me read something to you from the book Steps to Christ, page 47. Many are inquiring, how am I to make a surrender of myself to God? You desire to give yourself to him, but you're weak in moral power, in slavery to doubt and controlled by the habits of your life of sin. Notice, your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. How many of you have made New Year's resolutions? Kind of a vow to yourself. And how long does it last? They say 70% of New Year's resolutions are abandoned within 15 days. The knowledge of your broken promises and forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity and causes you to feel that God cannot accept you, but you need not despair. Like Peter, we all have to say, Lord, you know I love you. Yes, I denied you. I failed. Peter went out and wept bitterly. He repented of his sin. And we need to repent of our promise breaking but then trust that God forgives can you say amen? amen indeed let God be true Romans 3 4 but every man a liar God is true now our promises thank goodness our promises are not like God's promises God's promises are the best how many of you every now and then check up your credit score you know, years went by when I heard everyone talking about what's your credit rating, this will improve your credit rating, check your credit rating, we'll offer credit karma and all this. And I had no idea what my credit rating was. I wasn't worried about it because I paid all my bills. But I never even looked. Finally, one day, because you had to pay to look and find out what you had. I said, I'm too cheap to find out what my credit is. Finally, the bank said, free. You want to know what your credit rating is? And so I clicked and I found out what my credit rating is. And Fortunately, we're, we're still okay. We must be. We get a lot of offers from credit card companies to sign up. You know, they say a perfect credit rating is 850. And I remember once when I bought a car and they ran a credit check, I asked the dealer, I said, have you ever run into an 850? He said, no, never. I've never met anyone with a perfect score. I said, well, how do you get a perfect score? He said, I don't know. He said, I've met some people with really high scores. God has a perfect credit rating. He never breaks his promises. His word is good. 
You can read in uh, Psalm 89, verse 34. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. God never breaks his promises. Listen to this. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Now think about it. Why do humans sometimes break their promises? Promise money? I don't have it. They can't. Does God ever have a problem with saying, oh, I know I promised, but you know, I'm just, I'm all out of money now. I can't pay. Does God ever have that problem? Or another reason people don't pray, uh, uh, people might not keep their promises, is they promised something, they weren't aware of what was going to happen, how circumstances were going to change. Does God ever say, didn't see that coming? <laughs> Does he? No, he knows everything. So he has all resources, he knows everything that's going to happen. Why would God ever make a promise he couldn't keep? You think of any reason that a human might make a promise, that'll never apply to God. So any promise that God makes, he's going to keep it. But as with human contracts, some of God's promises have conditions. Some promises are given with conditions. But God never fails to keep his word. Let me give you a couple more verses on this. Joshua 23. Joshua's an old man. He calls Israel together before he dies. Verse 14, Joshua 23, 14. Behold, this day I'm going the way of all the earth. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. Not one word. Everything he said would happen to Israel happened. You can read a similar passage. 1 Kings 8.55 It says he stood and he blessed the congregation, I think this is Solomon, of Israel with a loud voice saying, Blessed be the Lord that has given rest unto his people Israel according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word. Not one, not one word of all his good promise which he promised by the hand of Moses his servant. You know, you look back someday in eternity, you'll see God has never broken a promise to you. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away. My word will not pass away. So you can count on the promise of God. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass will wither, the flower will fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Why? Because God is a king and he cannot break his word. Yeah, I can think of at least three times in the Bible, earthly kings made promises that they didn't want to, or, uh, to keep. You know, Herod, at this birthday party, he said to his stepdaughter, she'd come out and wiggle and gyrate, that he'd give her anything she asked for up to half his kingdom. And uh, she, he had no clue. He thought she'd say, oh, you know, I want a new dress, or I want a new chariot or something. He, he was trying to be big-hearted with all the guests. Oh, whatever you want, half my kingdom, what do you want? Mother said, go ask for the head of John the Baptist. Oh, he did not see that coming. Uh, Herod arrested John at the urging of Herodias, but he thought he was a prophet. Matter of fact, he'd go listen to him in his jail cell every now and then. But he had spoken and his word was law. And if a king breaks his promises, nobody's going to respect him. John lost his head. King Ahasuerus made a law that all the Jews should be attacked on a certain day. And then his wife tapped him on the shoulder and said, Honey, I'm a Jew. And he thought, oh, well, I made a law. I can't change that law, but here's what we'll do. We'll make another law that you get to attack your enemies first. He couldn't change his law. And King Darius made a law that if you pray to any god or man for 30 days, except to me, go into the lion's den. Uh, then they said, you know, Daniel, he's, he's breaking your law. And the king said, oh, I didn't realize what you guys were up to. He couldn't, they said, no law of the Medes and the Persians can be changed. And if that's true of the law of the Medes and the Persians, what do you think about the law and the promises of God? He's not going to break his promises. Now with that in mind, of course Daniel went to the lions then and he survived because the king had to keep his word. With that in mind, um, 
How should we feel about the promises of God? The Bible tells us that his word is filled with exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might become partakers of the divine nature. The Bible is filled with wonderful promises. How do you take advantage of the promises of God? You know, I made a list. I think I just wrote down 16 of some of my favorites of promises of God. Um, For God so loved the world. You know that one? Whoever believes in him might not perish. Fear not, I am with you. I'll uphold you. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a promise. If any of you lacks wisdom, James 1, 5, let him ask to, from God who gives to all men liberally. That's a promise. I've, I've just got tons of promises here that God has made to me. All these promises are promises he's made to me. But how, how come so many people don't experience the benefit of God's promises? There are conditions. Some people, he's promised whoever believes in him will not perish. You notice the condition? You got to believe in him. You need to ask him. So that's the key right there. Uh, Glenn Kuhn used to do these programs. He talked about the ABCs of prayer. The A is to ask. The B is to believe. The C is to claim. So one thing is believe in his promises. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Romans 4.20, and this was in our memory verse, Abraham did not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what he, God has promised, he is able to perform. Do you believe that? God is able to perform what he's promised. All right. Has God promised that he can save those that turn to him? Then can he save you? If God has enough potency in his sacrifice to cover the sins of the whole world, does he have enough to cover yours? Amen. If the Lord has enough power to save the sins from anybody, then doesn't he have enough power to save the sins of everybody? But a lot of us doubt if we're going to make it. Don't doubt. The people of Israel that doubted God could bring them to the promised land did not make it to the promised land. But the ones who believed made it. All things are possible to him that believes. Believes what? The promises of God. And the Bible is filled with rich promises that God has made to us. Hebrews 11.33 Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises. How do we obtain the promises? Through faith they obtained the promises of God. You know that old saying, God said it, I believe it. That settles it. You ask, you believe, you claim. You know, I can't help but wonder when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were staring down the fiery furnace and looking at Nebuchadnezzar, if they weren't wondering about Isaiah 43, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Neither will the flame kindle upon thee. And they said to Nebuchadnezzar, our God who we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. They were claiming a promise God had made and God would sooner send every angel in heaven to their aid than let his promise fall to the ground. For 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God are yes in him, in Christ. Jesus has given us the key to unlock all the promises of God. So I've got more to say, but I'm going to cut this short in righteousness. I, I, I want to share with you just some examples. So how do you release the promises of God? You ask. You claim. You know, God likes to be reminded that he's made a promise. You know, parents, sometimes when your kids say, but you promised. Boy, isn't that the deal? <laughs> Sealer there. You promised. And you go, ah, okay. Let's do the bedtime story. Here, whatever it is, you know, you said <laughs> You take a bath and we'll do this. And you, you promised. You have to deliver. Now, if earthly parents want to keep their promises, when we remind God that he's made a promise, does he like to be reminded? There's a lot of examples in the Bible. Abraham said to God, you promised my children will be like the sand of the sea. Jacob wrestled with the angel. And before he wrestled, he prayed and he claimed the promises. You said you'd bring us back to this land. And he obtained that promise. You can read where when Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, Moses is praying. 
God said, I'm going to wipe out these stubborn, stiff-necked people. And you know what Moses did? He called up the promise of God in the face of God. So wait a second, you made a promise. My God was waiting for Moses to do that. But it was through the intercession and prayer, Moses claiming the promise of God. 1 Kings 18.1, it came to pass after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying after the famine, go present yourself to Ahab, I will send rain on the earth. So after that long day on Mount Carmel, and after the prophets of Baal are slain, and uh, there's a great victory, there's still no rain. Elijah could have just folded his arms and looked at his watch and watched the sky. But you know what Elijah did? He went and he knelt and he looked at the ocean and he prayed. He says, you've promised. You said, I will send rain. And he, seven times he kept praying the promise of God. Did God keep his word? Elijah said to Elisha, Elijah speaking as a prophet, the word of the Lord. He says, I want a double portion of your spirit. Elisha says, I want a double portion of your spirit. Elijah says to Elisha, if you see me, when I'm taken up from you, it will be so. That's a promise. So he didn't take his eyes off Elijah and he saw Elijah go up in that flaming chariot. He says, all right, you, you promised double portion of your spirit. He went back to the Jordan River with the mantle of Elijah. He said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Why did he say that? He said, Lord, I saw it. You made a promise. And he hit the waters and they parted just like they did for Elijah. He was reminded of the promise of God. Jeremiah made a prophecy. After 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word, cause you to return to this place. Daniel chapter 9, he's reading the prophecy of Jeremiah. Daniel gets on his knees and says, Lord, he spreads out the scroll. He says, you made a promise after 70 years. Not long after that, Babylon falls and the children of Israel go home. He activated you know, some, some ingredients and some things don't come to life until you activate them by adding another component. He activated the promise of God by mixing it with prayer. And there's a lot of dormant prayers in the Bible that you will never enjoy unless you read them and you activate them by presenting them to the Lord through prayer. He wants you to benefit from those promises individually. But you got to read them. And then you present them to the Lord. You kind of cash them in. It's like cashing a check. And so he presented that to the Lord and, and God kept his promise. You know, nothing sadder than a, um, a promise that is not taken advantage of. And uh, God wants us to get a hold of his promises and believe it. I remember reading about a, uh, years ago back in the days of Lewis and Clark, when the American army was still uh, in its infancy, a hungry Indian wandered into a military fort on the frontier begging for food. And they gave the gentleman some food and he was eating. He understood enough English and they were talking to him. And, and uh, they noticed that around his neck he had something they hadn't seen before. It was a red, white, and blue ribbon holding a leather pouch. And they said, what do you have there? And he said, uh, I've got a letter. I said, well, what's, what is it? He said, well, I'm not sure. I can't read. And so he pulls this little scroll out of this leather pouch, and it's a discharge from the army where he served as a scout fighting during the Revolutionary War for General George Washington with a pension to provide for him for the rest of his life. So here he is. He's in a fort. He's begging. They said, man, you could have all the food you want because you've got a regular pension. You don't need to be begging. You're carrying around this promise from the president and you're starving. There's a lot of people in the world out there that are just struggling so much because they're not taking advantage of the promises that our king has made to us. Sea captain was telling a story one time. He was going through waters not far from Cuba. They heard the cry, man overboard. Now this is back in the days when they were not motor boats. They were uh, sailboats. And like trying to stop a train, those big ships, you just couldn't stop them. Uh, you know, water was too deep to throw out an anchor. And by the time you lowered the sails and you brought the thing about and launched a boat, you're five miles away from the man who fell overboard and he'd often drown. And uh, they heard the cry, man overboard. 
And they were all trained, everybody trained, throwing out the lifeline. If you were on a ship back then, they had a coiled up rope that was always ready at the stern of the ship. And as soon as you saw somebody went overboard, sometimes they fall from the rigging or whatever. They say, man overboard. Whoever could get to the stern as quick as they could, they grabbed the coil and they were trained to throw it. It would unravel as far out as they could. Hopefully the man would be able to grab the rope if the rope got away and the boat got away, especially if you're in shark infested waters. Uh, slim chance if you were in a storm or cold waters. I was reading another story. I'll get back to this one, but I got distracted. <laughs> Just this week I was reading about uh, people going around Cape Horn down there, Straits of Magellan, and uh, the rigging was full of ice and it was a storm and they ordered them up the rigging to bring in the sails and it was almost like a death sentence because the boat was rocking and it was so slippery and those sailors knew that if they fell overboard there would be no effort made to turn around in the storm. They just couldn't do it. And three men fell while they were trying to unfurl the sails and they got, and first mate just kept ordering other ones up the ropes. You got to go. We're all going to go ashore and crash unless you go up the ropes. So this other man, back to Cuba. This other man falls overboard. They shout, man overboard. Someone runs to the stern. They throw out the rope and the rope is going by. The guy swims over to it and he just gets it at the last minute. And they slowly pull him in. They were afraid to pull it too quick. He pulled it out of his hands. And so, because he's already got the boat dragging him like a water skier. And so they slowly pulled him in and they got him up into the ship and the captain said it took four hours to get him to let go of the rope. When he did finally let go of the rope, he had squeezed that old hemp rope so tight that parts of the rope were embedded in his skin. You know, God has made a lot of promises that have to do with your salvation. And uh, you not only need to believe them, you need to cling to them. Because the devil does everything he can to get us to shake, to shake our faith on the promises of God. He doesn't want you to believe it. He doesn't want you to read it. He doesn't want you to know about it because he wants you to starve. And God is saying, you need to know those promises. Claim them. See if you can trust me. Salvation is based on the promises of God. Amen? Amen.